one. Okay, great. So today I'm with Alex Voss. Alex, how are you today? I'm doing well, Sonny. Thanks for having me here. It's uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Yeah, I'm excited about our call today. As I was mentioning to you earlier, one of the things I'm starting to do is after about 100 or so episodes, I'm now expanding my horizon a bit and starting to talk to you know, people that are, I would say, working on projects that I consider to be freedom enhancing. <laughs> and this is actually a topic that's very near and dear to my heart. I don't know why, but like a long time ago, I don't know, 15 years ago or something, I started getting, oh, it sounds so corny to say, but like visions that I would somehow someday be part of some sort of like city building project, like future city uh, building project. And so when I recently met you, he started telling me what you're doing. I was like, what? There's actually people trying to do that with, you know, kind of freedom at the forefront. So I was just really fascinated by the project and I just thought I'd, you know, share with my audience who you are and then talk a little bit about your project. Mm -hmm. Yeah, sure. Absolutely. And and, and happy to, to do both of those things. But quickly, a little bit of background about myself. I'm a, a citizen of the US. I've been here my whole life. Midwestern America is a great place. Never want to leave that, that type of thing. Went to University of Chicago a number of years ago and studied economics there. Uh, at the time, so you may know the economics world is broken in, be in between the Keynesians uh, and the Chicago school with their smaller uh, school, the Austrian school as a, a much, much smaller branch of that. So I wanted to go study economics at the Chicago school, the relatively free market group, but had a, a high school basketball coach at the time that told me before you go there, make sure you don't get indoctrinated into the Chicago school, you should be reading the Austrian school too. Uh, and so that, of course, led me down the road to, you know, Mises.org and some of those other resources that are widely available. And so it really sparked my interest between the two uh, formal education and self-education, economics, and then the, the, the natural flow into libertarianism with free market economics really took hold in me. Since graduating, I, I worked a little bit of time in finance doing mergers and acquisitions in the healthcare space. And it was a fine job, nothing wrong with it. I enjoyed it, but I felt like it wasn't quite fulfilling me in terms of making a difference in the world. Fortunately, just about the time when I was having these thoughts, I was approached by a, a guy who wrote the book called Free Private Cities, Making Governments Compete for You reached out to me about potentially joining up with him in terms of being an ambassador for his, for his organization mm -hmm. uh, at first, and then, uh, and then coming on board in a bit more formal capacity to actually start a project company where instead of just promoting the idea of building private cities, we were going to actually try to go out in the world and do it. Interesting. So free private cities. It's probably a concept that most people haven't heard of. So you want to maybe dig in a little bit, like what that even means versus what? Like aren't normal cities free? And I guess to a large extent, private? Not really. Yeah, I don't know that, that, that most cities are private. They're certainly mm. um, pretty public in most senses. Free, I think that probably depends on the level of, at least in my conception of what freedom is the lack of government enforcement of rules and regulations. So that could be federal, state, local, any, you name it. I, I think that what really separates a free private city from a general city that you might come across in the U.S. or elsewhere is the autonomy that's given within this jurisdiction is entirely given to a for-profit city government operator. Mm -hmm. I, I'm not even sure that the, the term government operator is necessary. It's really a, we think of government services, in particular, local government services, 
are just that they're services. It's not, it's not a top down authoritarian. You have to do things this way because we say it. It's actually a service that you're providing for people. You're providing them a little bit of security in the market that they're living in. You are providing a community. You might be providing even some, what we would consider public goods, such as parks or docks, other things like the bridges, things like that. And so we think those are services where someone, in this case, our company could come in, provide those services, and we could have citizens who want to come in and live in our city. We agree with them on a contract before they move in. And we say, okay, we'll provide X service. You pay us X amount and everything else you're free to do. The only thing you can't do is break your contract with us or violate the rights of other people that live in this city. But I think that sort of creates the incentive where the government is not providing any sort of welfare benefits. All we're doing is providing those basic tenants of what you might need in order to live together. Uh, and that's what we call it, the market for living together and letting freedom flourish to, to fulfill the rest of the services that anyone might need. But you're saying you have to, right? Meaning, doesn't, doesn't that sound a bit like government already? But from what I know, most contracts, you don't have to do anything, no? Like in the sense that you don't have to engage or, or you don't, uh, but in this case, you have to. And then aren't you then beholden to these group of people, i.e. you and your friends? And, and who knows, maybe you expand your powers just because our economy starts doing so well. But yeah, curious, what is, so how does that look? Sure. I, I think it might be my, my loose language more so than anything deeper than that, but have to is well, sure you have to abide by the contract, but you also voluntarily decided to enter the contract in order to live in our city. You could certainly stay wherever you are right now and live in any other non-free private city if you choose. And in, in the future, we hope that there's a plethora of free private cities, some that for traditional families that have two kids and want to go to church on Sunday and others where they might support alternative lifestyles that different, that, that appeal to different groups of people. So I think the idea is we want to create a market in free private cities such that you can sort of pick and choose which city appeals to you and what contract terms appeal to you. And then once you do enter the contract, yeah, you would be held accountable for abiding by the rules of that contract. When I used to live in any city, am I not technically getting signed up to this contract uh, as well? Like Toronto has a contract and it means I got to pay, like you said, federal and provincial and this tax and that tax. And when there's certain, uh, there's a certain contract, no, or, or how is this fundamentally different? I, I can also the, leave, uh, sorry, in that case too, but I'm just trying to figure out like at the core of it, what it, yeah, yeah. How is it? Or is it like, is, is I don't know, is it like constant? Is there, I guess there is no constitution. So then, yeah, yeah. So just curious, how, yeah, how does that all come together? The So I, I think um, what we're talking about is an actual explicit contract that would be signed by both the government operator as well mm. as the potential citizen. What you referenced is what's frequently termed the social contract. We agree with most libertarians on that, that it's a mythical thing. It's not, I never signed up to agree to any social contract. If I moved into a free private city, I would have to actually sign a physical contract that says before either one of us does anything for the other person, these are your rights. These are your responsibilities. These are my rights. And these are my responsibilities. If you and I have a dispute, that'll be settled in X court in X way. And so I think having that explicit contract then allows people the information that they need to make a decision about where they live. That way, in your current case in, in Toronto or in mine in Chicago, hmm. I don't get a say over whether, in my case, I know the local politicians a little bit better than elsewhere. Hmm. Uh, Lori Lightfoot, the mayor of Chicago, if she caves and says, fine, we will increase the pension 
uh, payments for the teachers union. Hmm. I don't have a say over that. She's going to do it whether I like it or not. That is not something that could happen in a free private city because the, the private, the city operator cannot um, make any contributions. They can't do anything uh, with any public funds. There is no such thing as public funds. It's just you pay us X amount. We provide you security and safety and dispute resolution, maybe a few other little things, but mostly that's about it. And then if we make a profit off of it, then that's great. And that's our money to do with as we please. And if we don't, well, that's our, we have to figure something out and do it a different way. Uh, and all you have to do is, is live your life as you'd like and pay your contractually obligated fees. What's the closest example of something like this that's manifested in the world? Is it one of these like free zones or whatever in the world? Or like, what's the, just so that people can, I don't know, try and get their head around like where like, have experiments like this even been tested? Yeah, I think I would say we, we haven't seen much in terms of what I would describe as a completely private city. What we have seen is maybe one step down. So if you think of this as a spectrum, you might think of special ed economic zones as the least autonomous within this spectrum. Those happen all over the world. There's tens of thousands, maybe hundreds of thousands of them throughout the world. Typically, they're not for people to live in as much as they are for manufacturers to export with discounted tax rates, that type of thing. Then I guess on the other end would be an entirely private city, which would be beholden to no government at all. And then somewhere in between you have free zones or prosperity zones or charter cities, that type of thing. Those have been tried. They're not numerous the way special economic zones are, but they have been tried in a couple of different places. In particular, the, the, the most or the foremost example is in uh, the country of Honduras. And what they've done is they've actually changed their constitution and written a, a new law that allows for what they call ZAs, Zones for Economic Development and Employment. And what these ZAs do is they create special jurisdictions within Honduras that are still subject to Honduran criminal law, but are able to set up their entire legal and regulatory code as it relates to civil affairs on their own. So they can figure out how and, and how and when and who to elect and in what role they can create any laws or lack of laws, et cetera. They can create their own or lack of building permits and things like that. And the, the Honduran government has no say in what, what happens within these zones. Interestingly, uh, you might say well, that's a big caveat, the criminal law. It, it is in some ways, and that's why it's not a completely private city. But the enforcement of the criminal law, even though it's still Honduran criminal law, is up to the security force of the ZA itself. So as you can imagine, there can be uh, a little bit of selective enforcement, I would say, uh, in terms of even the criminal law within the zone. So it's probably the, in many ways, the freest place in the entire world now within these ZAs in Honduras, and, and currently there are three of them, although there are numerous more applications to create more ZAs in Honduras, hopefully that will even come before the end of the year. But you know, right now there's currently. That's fascinating. So, you, but okay, so if this has never been done really at this level, what prompted the Honduras, Honduran government to say, hey, let's just let people create their own laws and rules like were they just in a bad place or the you, I think you were telling me the story though like a whole bunch of people got voted in or something and they just all decided on it or, or what's the story behind that like how does that even happen I'm, I'm sure that there's backstory to it that I don't have the full context on but I I think in general the idea was to create if you look at some of the most successful cities in the world, uh, a number of them are over in China and, and in East Asia, where the really the Chinese government has created these special zones that allow for very significant levels of freedom 
uh, and autonomy. And because of that, they've really developed into these massive uh, cities at this point. So think of Singapore or uh, Shenzhen. And the idea in Honduras was, why not try in a small area to give some freedom and autonomy within Honduras and see if we can't have the same thing happen here? I do think partly it's a things aren't going so great in our country. And so maybe this is a an opportunity to allow for some innovation um, and see it, see if we can get some, attract some foreign investment, uh, see if we can't grow the GDP that way. But I think the idea was really just to, to try on an experimental level if these things would, would, would improve the, the country for many of the citizens without having to do it on the entire country basis. And what kind of uh, land area here are we talking about that, that the Honduran government has, Honduras government has permitted for this to occur? Sure. There, there are, they haven't necessarily designated one area and said, this is where you can do it. How it happens is landowners can, if they're sufficiently large, can submit an application to actually become a ZA themselves. And the group that oversees this is called CAMP. And they essentially um, are only looking to verify that you are in fact large enough and can actually become a ZA. They don't want this idea of just a household declaring themselves a ZA. So they want a certain amount of size and really even probably economic activity. So that's one way that you can do it. The other way is if you're already in a, a reasonable population. So for instance, a city could declare itself a ZA, but they would have to get a popular vote in order to do that. I don't know off the top of my head, the exact number and, and amount that they would have to get in order to meet that threshold, but they could also vote to become a ZA. And so what you have is the situation where currently there are three ZAs, but there could be numerous more on the way at any time. The current three, we're, we're quite familiar with two of them in particular. One is on the island of Roatan. So it's actually, it, if you think about Honduras and then you go north, there are three islands that are called the Bay Islands. The largest one in the center is called Roatan. And there's a small plot of land on the central northern part of Roatan that is currently called Zede Prosper. And th this is this was the first permitted Zede back when back in 2017, I believe. Since then, there's become another one of a little while north of uh, the town of San Pedro Sula in mm. in the mainland of of Honduras. And that one is a little bit larger and a little bit focused on a different clientele, I would say. They're very much focused on providing safety and security for local Hondurans and becoming more of a manufacturing hub within the heartland of Honduras, whereas Prospera is also providing many of those same services, but perhaps also a little bit more tailored towards American and, and Western expats that want to move down to what they would consider a, a libertarian paradise. Interesting. No, I was going to ask you is that what's the, this is really fascinating. Oh yeah, money. <laughs> how, how does that work in this place? I think the answer is uh, we don't know. And the reason we don't know is because we're not going to tell people how to deal with their monetary affairs. We won't have a central bank. We will allow people to use cryptocurrencies. They could use fiat currencies. They can use anything they want if they want. Our company and the future project company who runs one of these places will have to designate one, two, three, four, something like that currencies in which we accept payment in. Almost certainly this will include Bitcoin. That would probably be our preferred method of receiving a payment. We'll probably accept if it's in, um, for example, if it's in Honduras, we would accept probably US dollars and maybe Honduran Lempiras. 
if it was in Africa, we might accept euros, Bitcoin, and some regional currency too. So you know, okay. we'll, we'll just pick uh, what would be most useful in that area in terms of what we receive. But in terms of what people transact in, uh, it's whatever they'd like to do. We, we hope this becomes the, we really want to create an environment of healthy competition where the best can win and the people are going to decide on the market what they want money to be. And we're happy to have that experiment play out within our, within our city. Interesting. And, and then this contract that you said, right? Cause like th- that is probably the piece that I think I, I, at least I can see people getting stuck around is, is that it's free, but then there's this, like this contract where I have to pay someone and then they're giving me security. But how, how does, is it per, a percentage of how much you earn or your net worth or like, how does that even work? Or is it just like some flat fee that anybody can, if they can afford it, they can just move to this place. But what is that? Sure. I, I think the answer is it will depend on exactly where the project is. I know that in the current Honduran Zedes, the, the legislation that was passed requires the ZA to charge at least one tax. So all of the ZAs so far have charged income, uh, some income tax rate. Uh, those are very small in the broad and you know, in the grand scheme of things somewhere between five and 10% typically. I, it doesn't have to be that way. I think in other projects, we have another project somewhere in Africa at this time that we're, we're working on. If that, if we can truly develop that as a free private city and not as a prosperity zone or somewhere somewhat less autonomy, then I think it would probably be either some very small percent of income tax maybe one, two, 3%, or just a fixed fee. I don't think we have that necessarily solved. The answer is we want to provide a service that's valuable for people to move and live there and thrive there and be innovative and create a lot of great things within the city. And we want to be compensated for providing that. But we certainly don't think that we need exorbitant tax rates 20, 30, 40%. I, there's just, there's no way that would ever happen. Why even have that? Why even have that? Why not let the, I mean, (laughs) like private communities hire security people, right? Like I've lived in buildings and places where you just hire private. Like, why can't that also be private? And you've gone Uh, to the fact where it's no roads, no schools, no hospital. Okay. Then why even have that security element? Like, why can't people just it just seems like you're creating an environment where you, where people can't compete with you or something. Companies can't compete with you on security. Like, I just have to trust you. What if I want drone, like that, no, I don't know, ninja or something like that. They're like ninja drones that protecting me and you're only providing <laughs> human drone or something, a human sure. version or something. I don't know. My point is, how do you know that you're doing the best job for the people? I think... First of all, it would already be privatized since we would be a private company providing these services. That said, your point is well taken in terms of competition. We, we would allow it is the answer. If you wanted to, you didn't like the service that we are providing, feel free to hire your own. I think our, the way we view it is there has to be some base level of security for anyone to want to move there in the first place. And that's our responsibility to provide for. If you're a, a Bitcoin billionaire and you're worried about being mugged on the street, maybe you do want to have private security. We have no problem with you hiring extra security. Do whatever you'd like. Maybe you provide it better. And the whole citizenry says, this the, the security service that you're providing, Mr city operator is not very good and we like sunny's private security service either there could be a new private city that that uses your security service and they would quickly get a lot of clientele or we would be very much incented towards finding the best security service for our citizenry themselves since we are in fact a for-profit government essentially we need to provide the best service for the lowest price but we wouldn't outlaw you getting your own specific security service if you want. And so no hospitals, nothing like that. So 
let's say I do, or someone does move down there, not yet, but then there's, I guess there's stuff in neighboring places that you could leverage until things get set up. Is that kind of the thinking? Like, what's the time horizon on this project? Is this like, oh, we're working on it for 20 years now. And is it like, because you're building a city, right? Like, just think how long a building even takes to build, let alone a massive piece of land, let alone a city. It just must yeah. be the ginormous project. <laughs> yeah. So I think most of those services, like hospital services, school services would certainly be outsourced. We would want to the best in the world or the best in the region, whatever we can attract there to come in and provide uh, great service. And we would let people compete on it. If we had, you know, three hospitals, fine, let the best one win or let the best two win, whatever it works out to be on the market. In terms of a timeline, this is an idea that we've been thinking about for a long time, maybe not 20 years, but but eight, eight or so years, I would say. But in terms of development, the ZAs have been work have been in development now for uh, about two or so years. Uh, and they're making good progress. They've certainly developed some buildings on a, on both of the two. You know, ZA Morazan has made very quick progress just in the last six months, building close to, I think it's 80 apartments and a number wow. of uh, industrial warehouses. What's amazing is you're probably thinking about how long it takes to build a building from uh, very regulated Toronto standards. And I'm doing the same thing from very regulated Chicago or Illinois standards. The, the difference is you don't have all of those permits and regulations about when you can and can't and zoning laws, things like that. There are those don't exist necessarily within a pre free private city. They might be implemented at some point in some way, but the in order to provide a competitive service, they're going to be very simple. They're going to be very clean. Preferably, they're going to be allowed to get, you'll just go right onto the e-governance app that will be hopefully blockchain based and you just submit your request and it gets approved and within an hour you can go build your building as fast as you can. And so I think that this is one of the ways you really cut down on the time horizon for it. In terms of how long does it build a, take to build a city, that certainly is a bit longer than a building. But at the same time, what we want to do is we, we want to create some structure and process as for how the buildings will interact and work together to form a community. But at the same time, we are true free market advocates. And so we think we can't build a city top down and design it from beginning to end. We have to build structures and processes and then let the people who buy and or rent land develop buildings and develop other community assets how they would spontaneously. We're trying to create an environment in which spontaneous order creates an actual attractive city to live in. So if someone wants to be a part of the city, how do they do it? And does it come with a plot of land or something that they can actually go and start building something on? So it depends on, on which project it is that you're talking about. The first so one, the our, Honduras one, let's say. Yeah, yeah. And even there, it, matter, it, it, it depends just a little bit. Mm. So in, in Prospera, they are following the model where, yeah, you could actually buy land within Prospera. And I think, as, as far as I know, you buy the land and then once the land is yours, what you're actually buying there, I'm sorry, I just misspoke a little bit, is a, a 3D amount of space. You're, you actually are buying a cube of space in which you control. So if you- How, how like high does it go? <laughs> like, <laughs> well, I don't know that off the top of my head, but certainly it's, it's call it a square meter or a, a cubed meter. And if you buy as many of those as you want in whichever direction you want. And that way you can, can you can secure your, you know, land and maybe even a view of the ocean if you want, if you wanted that. Different things. You and buy how much is the cost of land? Is it very cheap right now? Because just because it's just getting started or, or what is the approximate cost? I guess um, I want to buy an acre or like a hundred acres or 10 acres or how big is the total land amount? 
The total land amount for Prospera right now, I believe is somewhere close to 25 hectares. They have just, I, I think it could grow here in the, in the near future to, to be more than 700 or so. I, these are rough numbers. I don't have them right off the tip of my tongue. We at we Tipolis are, we are small investors in the Prospera project. We're not the lead operators of it. So I don't have off the tip of my fingers, all of the details on those types of things, but it, it's going to grow very quickly, very soon. I, I imagine that property prices right now are rather low. That's the business model of the city operator is buy the land at a low price and sell it later on after a community has developed at a higher price. So if you are one of the first people to enter the community and be one of the pioneers, then I do think that you'd probably get the, the land at a re reasonably low price. Of course, that's higher risk because you are a pioneer in building the community that will you know, hopefully be there within 10 years. The, the other, you'd asked a little bit um, uh, earlier about how it works, and I said it, it depends on which uh, ZA. The other, the other ZA that we're quite familiar with is ZA Morazan, and that's the one that's north of San Pedro Sula. That community is actually going to not sell any land. What they want to do is continue to own all of the land and make money through leasing it out in rent. And this is an entrepreneurial community. So we'll see. I think one of the interesting uh, concepts in all of this is that it really is a, it's a free market in all of this. So you're free to try, Morazan is free to try the, we're only going to rent it out idea and Prosper is free to try the, we'll sell some land, we'll rent some other land, we'll keep some land for ourselves, et cetera. And we'll see what happens, uh, hopefully in, in a few years, we'll see, maybe we'll have some indications as to which one's more successful and maybe there are different ways to, uh, to do this as well. This is fascinating. Cool. And then you said this is a project out in Africa as well, right? That's more in the future. Yeah, I would say that the project in Africa is more in the future, but it's largely more in the future because it is very difficult to get a host country to allow to pass laws to allow the development of an autonomous or autonomous zone or, or prosperity city. That's the hardest part in any of this. Mm -hmm. Currently, the only country in the world that has anything approximating this really is Honduras. It's the it's at the forefront of this. And so our company, Tipolis, is trying to do this in Africa and make double the number of countries in the world that have something like this within their legislation. And so that's the, that is the <laughs> process that we are going through now. We hope to have more news on that before the end of the year, but as you know, I'm sure there's nothing guaranteed about it. Just because negotiations are going well at one time does not mean that anything will be signed. And so that's the reason I have to be somewhat cryptic about that now. I hope to, to come back maybe sometime in the future and share more about it after we can, but hopefully we'll have another country that has laws like this on their books and we can create a prosperity city, city sometime, somewhere in. That's fascinating. I was going to say, so when I mentioned this to my wife, she's from Colombia, and she did say that she was like, Honduras is not the safest place in the world. But so just curious, when you talk about security, is it security like between me and my neighbor or between between us and like the neighboring city or whatever it is, like the people who are in the old system? <laughs> sure. <laughs> yeah, it's it's a question that comes up frequently. The, the answer is it is it's mainly security intra city, but also some there has to be some element of security between you and the surrounding communities as well. The one thing that it's not for the ZAs and it, it's less likely to be in other cases as well is national defense. I'm not sure the ZAs can hold off El Salvador if they were to invade, but 
they are supposed to provide security for whatever happens internal to the community, as well as if cartels were coming and trying to run drugs through through the ZA, then yeah, it's we're supposed to provide for security in those terms. I think it's a it's a challenge, certainly, depending on what part of the world you're in. And so there's a couple of ways that this can be navigated, at least we believe. First, uh, choose an environment that is not terribly dangerous. This is not always within your ability to do, but in some cases it is. In particular, Prospera is not particularly in a dangerous area of Honduras. The Bay Islands lie north of Honduras, and there were British colonies for a long while. And then I think it was the United States, maybe 40, 50 years ago, forced the British to hand them back to the, or hand them to the Honduran government, not hand them back. They were never necessarily part of the Honduran government. And so they're they're English speaking communities. They're not really dangerous at all. They don't have much in the way of cartels. There are some drugs, there's some petty crime, sure, but they're more Caribbean island type of places than they are when you think of in the abstract Honduras. So that that's one answer that you know, Prospera has benefited from is the security is very much natural in the sense of being an island in a safe island at that. Morazan does not have that benefit. They are on the mainland. And I think that the answer to that is a, is a couple fold Certainly you need private security and I don't think private security necessarily can solve all problems, but we do see these models used throughout the world where private security is actually incented to, you know, create real security and not harass people better than in many ways, the public police and things like that are. You have to remember you're comparing this again anywhere else you could live in the world. So sure, Toronto is, is probably mostly pretty safe, but not everyone lives in Toronto. Some people live in the south side of Chicago, which is not safe either. Security is not a given anywhere in the world. And so the idea is to provide the at least to provide as well or better uh, than you can get elsewhere. We think private security can do that. Partly it might be provided for with you're allowed to own a weapon potentially. I, the, the ZA laws, you'd have to look at them specifically as to whether you're allowed, but in a true private city, we would certainly allow a firearm ownership that you could protect yourself. You could hire your own extra security guards as we already talked about. And so I think there are a number of ways that you can hedge your bets. And in, in a lot of ways, it's like the old, uh, the old saying, you, know, you don't have to necessarily outrun the lion, you just have to outrun your friend. <laughs> so it, you just don't want, you want to make yourself not the most vulnerable. And we think that private security can certainly make a free private city the not the le not the most vulnerable. And as such, it probably won't attract pe people that want to commit crime and, and make it unlivable. Interesting. Who's the Fauci of uh, this land? <laughs> I, I'd say our... that's probably <laughs> I'd say that's probably the best part about this land is there is no Fauci. <laughs> there is, there's no one like that. There's no one, even if there is someone who tries to be like that, they have no say. They can't do it. It's it's almost it's one of the blessings of having this contract that it might be restricting your freedoms, fine, but it's also restricting the government in what they can do. So if we sign this contract and it says you pay X and we provide Y, that's all that we can do. We can't then become Fauci. We can't hire a new Fauci. We can't get a new World Health Organization that says, turns out the common cold this year is uh, a little worse. And so we're going to lock you in your house. There is no such thing as that in, in our community. And so you, you might think, you know, I, I guess it depends on your perspective, but I, I think most people that would be interested in moving to a community like this would probably find that a, a very relieving. And at the same time, probably not terribly concerned because if there was a very serious outbreak of an illness that really was a threat to most people at most times, 
it's our belief that collective action could happen voluntarily. It's not, I don't think most people are trying to die and people would voluntarily do what actually the science tells you to do mm. in order to not get sick and die. But for less dangerous illnesses, I, I, my opinion is, first of all, it's not my opinion. We would not be able to do shut down society. And it is my opinion that society would not have shut down if they weren't hoodwinked by a Fauci or similar person. So, so I guess, sorry, just to rewind a bit. So you do rely a bit on the Honduran government to give you national security. You said it can't protect against El Salvador, let alone United States or some big country uh, for now. But because there's this unwritten or written rule that they're going to protect you, they must be expecting some sort of payment, no? So is there another 5 or 10% that goes to these guys? Yeah. So in Honduras, that is part of the law. The one tax that the ZAs pose is, you know, roughly 5 or 10%, depending on the ZA. And of the revenue that's raised, I'd have to double check, but I believe it's 12% is paid out to five different Honduran government entities. So it's, it's not an extra tax, it's part of the revenue. So the city operator has to figure out how to build a big, a budget where they can tax, call it 5% within the revenue they raise, they can provide all the services that they say they would, they can pay 12% to the Honduran government, and then they have enough left over to be a profitable enterprise. And that's up to them to provide. So that a little bit paid out to the Honduran government is included within the tax rate. And, and in some ways, I full disclosure, think taxation is theft. I don't agree with any of it, but in some ways in this particular case, it's not the worst thing because if these ZAs are very successful and they are paying even this small tax, it might become such a large sum that's given to the Honduran government that it actually incents the Honduran government not to mess with the program and let it continue to go for forever, basically. Don't, you know, milk the cow instead of um, uh, kill the goose that lays the golden egg. So, so it's, it sounds like it's like a, just it's like a lower tax friendlier environment, right? Where you, I guess you don't have the Fauci's and you don't have all these other people, but but you are effectively having to pay a certain percentage of your whatever monthly for national security, like you said, or, or sorry, not even, no, a 12% of it would be national security. And then the other whatever percentage would be security on the streets, yeah. which I guess you can compete with. Interesting. Okay. So I guess what else? Do you have an airport? That was another thing I was thinking. So in, in the Prosper, the closest airport is the Rota International Airport. So there's not a specific airport for the ZA. That said, you can ship things to the ZA and, and mail them to the ZA and they have their own customs program. So uh, any mail that comes in through the international ports or international airports will be not touched or at least is not supposed to be touched by anyone in the Honduran government or the Roatan government and mm. is immediately sent on to uh, Roatan where they um, where they will handle it in their own, with their own facilities. So no no airport there it's really it's frankly it's not large enough for that. There's one international airport for the whole island of Roatan. It's an island of about 115,000 people. There's no need for another airport necessarily. Uh, the one in North of uh, Ciudad Morazan, the one north of San Pedro Sula, also does not have an airport. It's not large enough for an airport, but they also have their own customs and, and immigration protocols. In a lot of ways, they work hand in hand with immigration and customs and get you know things transferred over to to the ZA to be handled that way. But there is no uh, explicit airport. Interesting. And can you borrow money on behalf of the people? No. Interesting. No. And you no, can't no. print money on behalf of people because you don't even meddle with it. Yep. And you don't, you do, you don't tax, but it's like a, like a fee that you have to pay type of deal. Yeah. It's a fee uh, for service. What if yeah. you stop paying it? They just, I guess uh, security guys just come beat you up or something. 
I don't think they would come beat you up, but I, if you broke your contract, then you would probably be removed. We can't steal your property, but we can exclude you from, from the community. If you say we're, uh, you signed a contract, you um, came into the area and you were being a nuisance, and then we sued you and took you to court, and the court found, it's an independent court, by the way, it's not somewhat, it's not our court, it's not your court, it's uh, supposedly a disinterested court, and that's how they've set it up in Prospera and, and other Zedes. If you were found uh, to actually be in violation of your contract, we could remove you from the community. But just because we can remove you from the community does not mean that we can take your assets and, and your anything you own. That's still yours. You can do with it as you please. The only thing you can't do is come back into our zone if you were excluded permanently or for a period of time. Interesting. Interesting. Cool. So this is so you would declare this the freest place on planet Earth, right? So we have a question. How, how many people live there today? Anybody? Or is it just, is there like a date that you guys are going to all move there? Is it like big party? When is like day one or something? Or is it already, are people living there? Yeah. So people must be, no? Yeah, people are living there. Uh, it's not, it's not many. It's, I think on Prospero, there might be uh, 15, 20, something like that. There are about 30 people that work there on a daily basis. They have they, they built in Prospera what they call the beta building, which is offices that uh, local Hondurans come and use. And international companies typically headquartered in the U.S. actually hire Honduran workers through ZA Prospera, and they do some remote work for them there. So there are people that use and live in these areas, but it's not... Uh, a thriving city yet. They're in the process. Prospero right now is building, what they've built is prototype apartments. Um, those are being, you know, filled up, but the, what they have next on their docket is much larger amounts of living arrangements in, in particular for, for young, young people that want to come and live in a sort of freer but also city environment and so i think that's next on the docket and then in in ciudad morazan there are maybe even fewer people living there currently although i do think that they're quickly they're finding some success in terms of signing rental agreements with people to come in and, and live there very soon so i my my gut, and I don't know this necessarily to be true, is that in Ciudad Morazan will have, you know, a community of probably in the low thousands, even within a year, would be my guess. It's, you know, it's certainly hard to say, and these things are based on a number of different factors, of course. Um, but I, I think we're seeing the the budding of small communities that are developing. And if things go well, they'll move quicker. The, the way we think about it is the first stage is get to about a thousand people, then get to about 10,000 people. And then the final step is get to 35,000 plus where you actually have not a big metropolis, a community sized, uh, you know, city where people can walk around and live and there's enough to do. And a large enough population base to provide for a number of different, you know, entertainment options and hospitals and things like that. So we, we think that that's the third and final stage. And right now we're in, you know, stage one. When do you think you'll get to that stage three, the 35,000? It certainly depends on the project and how much demand there is for it. I would hope that three to five years. And how are you guys a, getting the word out? Like, how are people, I guess, like, just like this, right? Podcasts and stuff, or like, how are people finding out about it? Yeah, I think podcasts, uh, we, we do have a foundation. Tipolis is the for-profit sort of project or company arm. And then the idea of free private cities was really promoted by my boss at Dr. Titus Gebel. He 
he wrote the book on it and created uh, Free Private Cities, which we've subsequently turned into a foundation. And so they're really trying to promote the idea of this. We just held a conference in Switzerland last weekend called the Liberty in Our Lifetime Conference, where we had presenters from various ZEDES, from, I don't know if you've heard of Liberland, which is this area between Croatia and Serbia that's not claimed by either country. And so it was claimed by the Liberlanders to make it into a free country, basically. We call intentional communities. So trying to build factual private cities rather than a truly legally autonomous cities or free cities. And so I think we're spreading the word through all of these types of means. Podcasts, people are searching for it on the internet. We're just finding that the um, the interest in this topic is growing very quickly, particularly. And, and can can, can, can someone community. move there today? No, there's no, like they, you guys would have to build residential because it sounds like you're building offices or something. But like if somebody wanted to just, if you wanted to go anywhere, you just look on Airbnb, find some places, go and get a three month place and then look for a place. Like could someone start thinking about that? No, not yet. Uh, no, I think they could. They think they could. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Both in Morazan and... Uh, and Prospera. I do think that's absolutely possible. They, they both have websites. They both have full full teams that are available to answer these questions. And, and certainly if you were interested in moving there, I'm, I'm sure that they would immediately like to be in touch with anyone who's thinking about that type and of what, idea. And what would someone need to be able to move there? Would they have to invest a certain amount or pass some sort of, I don't know, Test I think you'd sort. have to like, I, IQ test. No, I'm kidding. I don't know. There's yeah, got to yeah. be something, no? Potentially, I, I I don't know for sure. I think there has to be some level of Condurin. You have to pass some levels that are put in place by the Honduran government in terms of. Yeah, I'd have to get back to you on exactly what you'd have to do in that way. But in terms of investment, no. What you'd have to do is. Probably at this time, if you wanted to move there quickly, you'd have to sign some sort of rental agreement with in some apartment in either one of these zones in order to live there. So there's Maybe apartments probably. there inside these zones now, like for rental, for for people to live? There are, yeah. There's not a ton in, in Prospera. I, I, my, my like a couple hundred, there. hundred units. Oh, well, l- less than that. In Prosper, we're talking tens. In in Morazan, there are, I think I mentioned earlier, maybe they've built something like eighty in the last. I think they're going to build another half a year. They have, my understanding is they've quickly rented many of them. So I'm not sure in terms of how many they have versus how many they've already signed uh, rental agreements for, but these are absolutely things that are happening, you know, as we speak, but it is, I just, I did, I, I caveat this all with it's early stage for all of these things. It's not, you can't expect this to be necessarily like a full thriving community where you just go and rent it at this stage, it is truly, it's more of the pioneers. It's the early settlers, the people that have, in many ways, ideological reasons for moving. They just want to live in a free private city. Not necessarily they want the most luxurious lifestyle at this point in time. We hope to get there very soon, but that's just not the the status of things at this moment. And... uh... Interesting, but, but 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 could they get there? Okay, so you there's a roof over your head, and then you need food, right? So there's a grocery store or something, yeah. or like how does that work? Are we eating Uber Eats, or how are people eating? Yeah, there's no uh, there's no grocery store in either one of them yet, as far as I'm aware. It certainly will be there soon. How far of a drive do you have to go to the nearest place to buy food? Oh, in in Prospera, ten minutes. Oh, okay. Yeah. It's not terribly remote. It's you just basically drive off of the ZA and down the street and you'll be at a you'll be at a supermarket of sorts. Oh, yeah. okay, okay. Oh, yeah. interesting. 
it's livable. It's definitely livable. It's not, I don't mean pioneer in that you're, you know, building a log cabin, just pioneer in that you're one of the first people there. It's not a full thriving community. Yeah, I get it. Wow. Interesting. This is fascinating. And if you can send me some pictures or any videos, or even like, uh, I was thinking Google map, like overviews or where this is and stuff like that, or whatever, I would love to, I'll like, pull it into the as like b-roll or something for this interview but i, I wanted to share because i don't want i don't want people to walk away with just like words like i want them to realize that this is like a real life thing and it's going down as we speak and it's pretty exciting i'm not gonna lie this is this sounds really fascinating there's some really in latin america i was gonna say like el salvador with making bitcoin their main crypto whatever form of money or reserve currency or whatever and then oh sorry legal tender and now hearing this and i don't know i just keep hearing like great things coming from latin america there's just always something or another interesting happening well i think it's it's kudos to them for experimenting and trying new things and sure you know in a lot of ways they have they have a an incentive to do these things at least quicker than a lot of other countries. You know, El Salvador is, at least was formerly on the, uh, the U.S. dollar standard, but when the U.S. prints, what, 27% of all dollars that have ever been created by the United States were created in the last 18 months, something outrageous like that. Guess who didn't get any of those dollars? Anyone in El Salvador. The U.S. dollar standard doesn't quite work to their benefit, and so they realize that a Bitcoin standard might work better. And I think similar analogies exist for why Honduras did this. It's things are not, if, yeah, just to be frank about it, things in Honduras are not as good as they are in the United States. And so they have more of incentive to try this. There's a reason why free private cities are not in the U S it's because they won't talk to us. They have no reason to talk to us. They like think they being the politicians, the government, they like things how they are. And they're going to stay like that for at least a longer period of time than they will in Honduras. So I think that's about why we're hearing these type of uh, innovative ideas. And I think it hopefully will have others around the world, other nations that are developing still try innovative experiments like this, whether it's in cryptocurrency or if it's in uh, free private cities or some other domain, it's, it's nice to see some innovation and, and some allowing of innovation in these places. Definitely, definitely. Yeah, with all the weirdness going on, I think a lot of people are looking for freedom right now. So good on you to be working on this project. So what else? Is there anything else you want to share? I mean, I thought that was pretty uh, comprehensive. And I had all these like, weird questions. But thank you for uh, being patient with me. But it is I'm not gonna lie, super fascinating, because it's not every day you get to talk to someone literally creating a new city and not just a city, but <laughs> A freedom oriented city. Yeah. I think we covered a lot of the basics of it. The other thing I would mention is if people are interested in learning more, certainly provide you with some links. Maybe yeah. you can put them in the show notes. Lovely. I'll happily give out my email here sure. and uh, people can get in touch if they want. We are in the process of developing our team and growing very quickly. There are a lot of different ways to get involved. And so please do, if you have an interest in this space, reach out to me and, and I'd like to you know, see if we can't use uh, your expertise, you, the abstract listener, your expertise. Because I, I think one of the things that we realized in the development of these cities is we don't know it all, we can't plan it all. We can get really smart people that have a lot of expertise in a lot of diverse areas, but we need help from others too. We try to bring in finance experts and urban planning experts and things like that. Just the other day, we were speaking with some people about digital ID and privacy, those types of things. These kinds of concepts are going to be crucial in order to build a city the way it ought to uh, run in terms of maximizing freedom and letting people live and let live, that type of idea. And so if you can contribute to that in any fashion, certainly get in touch with me and, and we'd, we'd be happy to talk to you and see if we can't find a role. 
as we move forward with, with these projects. So my email is Voss, my last name, V as in Victor, O S at Tipolis, T I P O L I S dot com. And feel free to just shoot me a message and we'll see if we can't line up a time to talk. Awesome. Awesome. That's great. Okay. Well, that's perfect. So let's maybe bring this one to an end on that note. If there's nothing else, if there's nothing else. Yeah. We can pick this up on another episode sometime in the future. I would love to get an update. And I got to admit, I'm, you've definitely piqued my interest as well. I'm like, why am I not getting on a plane right now? <laughs> <laughs> no, it's cool. It's very cool. And I like it. I like how you're thinking about things from first principles and just rebuild. I think the world needs tinkering along these lines, right? To the lines of a city, not just like a new phone or whatever it is. And you rarely hear about people applying innovation at that level. I barely ever hear about it. So yeah, this is super cool. Super cool. Love it. I love it. Okay. Thank you, Alex, very much. I guess I'll bring this one to a close then. Very good. Thank you again for having me. I appreciate it, Sonny.